you know, if you want to know where it's at, you've really got to know where you've been. This is the Righteous Bo Jambo, and it's time to talk about the 1920s. Crazy Blues by Mamie Smith, the record that started the whole shebang. If this isn't the most important record ever made, I don't know what is. Nineteen twenty one Sounds of Africa by UB Blake. UB Blake was a daring and inventive composer who took legitimate black musical forms onto the Broadway stage. One of the first, if not the very first, associations of the words rock and roll in a sexualized context on record, W.C. Handy remains a strong influence here on the arrangement. But here are the blues in all their newborn and primal glory. Suitcase Blues by Hersel Thomas Texas piano man Hersel Thomas, who some say was as young as 16 when he recorded this, lived a short and travelled life before he died of food poisoning in Detroit in 1926. Albert Ammons and Mead Lux Lewis, two of the forefathers of rock and roll, named Thomas as a seminal influence. It ain't gonna rain no more, Wendell Hall. Wendell Hall, a popular vaudeville star, hit big with this jolly, jaunty pop tune in 23. Shortly thereafter, it crossed the Atlantic and became one of the earliest songs sung on English football terraces, adopted by Sheffield United Football Club, whose supporters sang it gaily as they won the 1925 FA Cup. Wildcat Blues, Sidney Bechet. Bechet was the first great soloist to break out of New Orleans and into a northern recording studio, predating Louis Armstrong by several months. Most famed as a clarinetist, he also helped popularise a vaudevillian novelty instrument that no one had much time for in those days, the saxophone. Move over Sidney Bechet, all satchel mouth just rolled into town. The record that introduced the world to the great Louis Armstrong as cornetist in his hero and mentor, Joe Oliver's hot jazz band. Nineteen twenty four Big Bad Bill is Sweet William Now by Billy Murray. A saucy little tune by one of the eldest statesmen of the recording industry. In the early days of the recording industry, Bill Murray had been one of the very biggest stars, making anywhere between six and ten thousand recordings. The wreck of the old 97, Vernon Dalhart, for many, many years, this was the biggest selling record ever. It took White Christmas to knock it off its perch. Dalhart, who took his name from his Texas hometown, was a successful light opera singer who recorded over 4,000 sides under a variety of names, but always remained true to his roots and ended up recording possibly the most famous country song of all time. Rhapsody in Blue, Paul Whiteman with George Gershwin. Whiteman's billing of the King of Jazz, which in fairness he always disavowed, was most certainly not deserved. But Gershwin's immortality as one of the foremost geniuses of American music was most certainly deserved. Come on, fingers, percolate, percolate, fingers. Here's where we do the meanest blues ever. 1925, Hesitation Blues by Arthur Gilham. 
a song so old it registers on the Round Folk Song Index and recorded with gusto by Charlie Poole. Gilham's version of this chestnut digs out every grain of wry wit and bawdy humour. Shake That Thing by Papa Charlie Jackson. The rather mysterious Jackson was a great singer of salty songs on his guitar, ukulele or banjo. This song, like most songs about shaking things, is marvellous fun. Don't Let Your Deal Go Down, Charlie Poole. We talked about Charlie Poole in TRB number four, the original country royster doister who picked his banjo, picked fights and picked country music up by the scruff of the neck and made it a thing. As we saw in TRB 17, Ma Rainey was the godmother of the blues, and here she proves that that is no empty honorific. Seldom has the maxima of the blues being nothing but a good woman feeling bad been more clearly articulated. St. Louis Blues, Bessie Smith. The first true masterpiece of the blues, and still one of its foremost exhibits, had Bessie Smith not already been proclaimed Empress of the Blues by the time this record came out. That title and her everlasting supremacy were confirmed by it. Since I cut your sword, mama, drink your blood. 1926, New Prison Blues, Pegleg Howell. Pegleg Howell was the meanest man in the blues. He got his nickname when his brother-in-law shot him in the right leg. He later lost his left leg to diabetes, but retained his nickname despite being technically no leg Howl. This is the first country blues released on Columbia, fittingly while Howl was in prison. Dr. Jazz, Jelly Roll Morton. Piano maestro, teller of tall tales, the doctor present at the delivery of jazz, Morton claims to have done everything first short of fighting Godzilla. In truth, he was the first person to write arrangements for the unruly, funky street music of Storyville and one of the most important composers in the music's early history. Some say he died in 1941, but seeing we haven't had confirmation from Morton himself, I'm disinclined to believe it. Nineteen twenty seven Wildcat Joe Venuti and Eddie Lang. If you played Guitar Hero in nineteen twenty seven, you basically had one choice the swinging, fleet fingered Eddie Lang. Here he supports popular violinist Joe Venuti with whom he worked in Paul Whiteman's orchestra. Lang died at thirty one during a routine tonsillectomy. Dopehead Blues Victoria Spivy. Spivy recounts the invincible dopehead here in a rather fantastical lyric with her trademark phrasing and clear diction. Often lost behind Bessie Smith in the consideration of the early blues singers, to do so is to unfairly dismiss a great talent. East St. Louis Toodaloo, Duke Ellington, an early flowering of one of the foremost geniuses of American popular music. This is the blues as low, down and dirty as the Duke ever conjured it. In a Mist, Bix Beidebeck. Louis Armstrong's greatest rival is a cornetist. They say his tone sounded like a young girl saying yes. Here, however, Bix shows a deft and wily touch at the piano, an instrument he seldom played and was never otherwise recorded on. He died at age 28 of the delirium tremens during a heat wave in Queen. You're Gonna Quit Me by Blind Blake. On this excellent example of the Piedmont blues style, Blake is an outstanding guitarist with a great sense of swing and ragtime, singing a mournful blues with resigned ease, ludicrously violent and all, a great recording and a great performance. 
If I had my way, I'd tear the building down, Blind Willie Johnson. One of the mythical, legendary bluesmen, Blind Willie Johnson is also the only bluesman to have left the solar system. His Dark Was the Night and Cold Was the Ground included on the gold disc with the Voyager spacecraft. No one has articulated human misery, rage and righteous fire like Blind Willie Johnson. My name is Charles Guiteau. My name I'll never deny. Charles Guiteau, Kelly Harry. In our first visit to Harry Smith's anthology of American folk music, the still unsurpassed three-disc collection of Weird Old Americana, the fantastic Kelly Harrell recounts the story of President Garfield's killer and affords him a measure of dignity in the telling. Stardust, Hoagie Carmichael. There are two Stardusts, both the same song. There's this, the charming and slightly Ellingtonian mid-temp jazz piece, and there's a sentimental ballad it evolved to in the 1930s, later mastered by Nat King Cole. This version is so full of invention and clever compositional tricks, the last word you could use to describe this standard is standard. Nineteen twenty-eight, Tain Nobody's Business, Frank Stokes. This isn't the same song that was made famous by Bessie Smith, Jimmy Witherspoon, or BB King, but it's a great record nonetheless, largely because Stokes is a huge talent, a sprightly and nimble guitarist, and a strong singer. Kokomo Blues, Scrapper Blackwell. Baby, don't you mind. Later appropriated by Robert Johnson, Jake Blues and President Obama as Sweet Home Chicago. Fishing Blues, Henry Thomas. A good-natured blues standards on which Thomas accompanies himself on a guitar which sounds like it's strung with banjo strings and a Texas folk instrument called the quills which were like pan pipes. Old Dog Blue, Jim Jackson. A walking songbook of blues, hokums, ragtime and medicine show tunes. Jackson's tribute to a faithful, departed hound rambles and charms its way through chord changes that just seem to happen and a melody that goes where it will. Canned Heat Blues, Tommy Johnson. They say Robert Johnson sang like a man five minutes away from the electric chair. Tommy Johnson sang like the man who pulled the switch. Dark, sulfurous, a beast of a blues born on black wings. To know the blues is to know this song. Stealing by the Memphis Jug Band. Massaging the mighty Mississippi Sheiks, the Memphis Jug Band was a long-running institution in the Buff City, having been the first band to make records there that were widely distributed. The song was covered by the Grateful Dead as their first single in 1966. How Long, How Long Blues by Leroy Carr a frequent collaborator with the above-mentioned Scrapper Blackwell and a huge influence on Nat Cole and Ray Charles, this was Carr's debut single. Despite his hopeless alcoholism, Carr managed to become the biggest selling blues act of the 1930s before expiring to nephritis and booze in 1935, having barely turned 30. that stuff alone, Will Shade. Will Shade was the leader of the Memphis Jug Band, but here he leads a slightly more sophisticated group in this commentary on the wave of canned heat addiction that swept the South. Canned heat was the nickname for Sterno, a cooking fuel that was basically napalm. 
Impoverished drunks would buy it because it was cheaper than the hooch, but it was wildly addictive and destroyed the nervous system, frequently blinding imbibers or crippling them with what was known as the Jake leg. It's tight like that, Tampa Red. Tampa Red was the king of the hokum blues, as demonstrated here. Playing in the Piedmont style on a then-rare national resonator, Red had a long career foregoing hokum, singing topical blues, and even becoming an influential figure on the early Chicago scene. Sugar Baby, Doc Boggs. Another selection from Harry Smith's anthology of American folk music. Doc Boggs was one of the key drivers to the 1960s folk revival and was rediscovered just in time to be rightfully hailed as a master of American mountain music. And seriously, go buy the anthology of American folk music. It is amazing. Peg and All, Carolina Tar Heels. A favourite of mine, this protest song about modernisation in the shoemaking industry still rings true even to a hardcore market forces guy like me. John Hardy was a desperate little man by the Carter family. The biggest selling and longest lasting act who came out of country music's Big Bang event Ralph Pierre's 1927 Bristol, Tennessee sessions. The Carters had another half dozen years ahead of them as consistent sellers here, but this was one of the old-timey tunes that made them so beloved from the very beginning. Funky in a dog cart, Huit Ming. Who doesn't love a little hoedown in the lockdown? Huit Ming, sometimes billed as Floyd Ming, was a potato farmer who led the hottest string band in Choctaw County, Mississippi for a good many years, churning out delightful little romps like this now and then. How do you want to roll down the line, Uncle Dave Macon? There was nobody like the Dixie Dewdrop, Uncle Dave Macon. Banjoist, folklorist, comedian, and a general law unto himself. A key figure in establishing the Grand Old Opry in Nashville as a music city as a whole, his rambunctious and good-natured tunes were just a reflection of his own larger-than-life personality. King Kong Kitchi Kitchi Kaimi O, Chubby Parker. This ultra-bloodthirsty version of Froggy Went A-Courtin was recorded by the genial Parker, an electrical engineer who literally ran away from home to join a circus. There was an old man left foot of the hill, he ain't moved away. The Old Lady and the Devil, Bill and Bill Reed. I love this song, hilarious, rich in image and vivid in detail. The Devil makes a deal with the farmer and they both get more than they bargained for. Big Rock Candy Mountain by Harry McClintock. A very old song indeed. Most people would know this as the sanitized version recorded by Burl Ives, but here it is in all its hobotastic glory and almost as original. I say almost original because the last verse, as published, was actually left off the record being considered obscene at the time. West End Blues, Louis Armstrong. Louis Armstrong is a titan of American music. He is necessary and irreplaceable. Even if he didn't make West End Blues, this would be so. Even if he had only ever made West End Blue, perhaps this is so. Perhaps even if he'd only ever made the first 12 seconds of West End Blues, this would be so. Nineteen twenty nine. Tain no sin, Ben Selvin's orchestra. Heaven forfend this be considered politically incorrect or tone deaf these days. Good for anyone who considers it great fun and has, even if only once, taken off their skin and danced around in their bones. The Dirty Dozens, Speckled Red. 
later revived by the great Kokomo Arnold as The Twelves. This is one of my favourite blues tunes. It's a raunchy wander through the underside of love on the poor side of town, and one of the most frank discussions of queer perspective from a male point of view in the blues to that time or of all time. Interestingly, Speckled Red was an albino. I just thought I'd throw that in. The Ducks Yes, 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 Stump Johnson. We visit St. Louis for a song which may or may not have migrated up the Mississippi from New Orleans. Yes is the name of the native New Orleans dialect, but St. Louis has long claimed it as its own. Whatever the truth, the song has travelled far and wide and is a true staple of the hokum style. Last Kind Word Blues, Gishi Wiley. One of the most mysterious blues singers ever. No one knows where or when Wiley was born or died. She only recorded six sides and there are no known photos of her. But on the basis of these sides, there is a wide school of thought that considers her to be one of the greatest, if not the greatest, rural blues singer of the 1920s. He left me this morning Blue Yodel number six, Jimmy Rogers, explodes the myth that white boys playing the blues in the early 1950s invented rock and roll, because before anybody had done anything, Jimmy Rogers had done it all. And that's why he was the first man elected to the Country Music Hall of Fame. How can a poor man stand such times and live? Blind Alfred Reed. At one point mutilated by Rock's village idiot elect, Bruce Springsteen. Back in 1929, a genuinely poor man told us like it was, because for him, that's the way it was. When the levee breaks, Memphis Minnie. If Bessie Smith was the Empress of the Blues, Memphis Minnie was the First Lady of Ramblin'. Recorded with Kansas Joe McCoy, Minnie's nimble guitar work frames the story of the great 1927 flood, a critical event in starting the great Black South North diaspora and the spread of the blues to Chicago, Cincinnati and Detroit. Good morning, meine Freunde. I certainly hope you found today's presentation to be interesting and that it piqued your curiosity. And I hope that you take the time over a cool beverage and a plate of biscuits to review the playlist for today's entry. This of course will be the first of a semi-regular series looking to build up a collection of 500 essential recordings from across the decades. I'd love to hear your comments and thoughts on it in the section below. So, until the next time we meet together in good company or the nasty YouTube police shut the channel down, you stay righteous and remember, if you want to know where it's at, You've got to know where you've been.